are reading from Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, your suffering, and your poverty, but you are rich, and I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Amen. That's my grandson. <laughs> and it's his birthday. It's also his mother's birthday, which is very convenient. <laughs> so, and she happens to be my daughter. <laughs> Can you bow your head with me for another little word of prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we are about to open your word. And Lord, we can't do that without help from the Holy Spirit. So Lord, today we ask that you would take my words and bless them and may each person hear what they need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the second uh, part in a series of sermons that are about the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Um, and this church is about the church of uh, Smyrna. Now, the first one uh, was last week, um, two weeks ago, and it was on the church of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a large church, I mean a large city, and it had a large congregation of, uh, of people in it. But... Uh, Ephesus um, was known as the light of Asia. And that gives some particular meaning to uh, Jesus walking amidst the, the ten golden candlesticks and the warning that if, uh, if they didn't repent, he would remove their candlestick or their light. And so it is that uh, Ephesus as a city... I can't say that as a church because we don't know what became of those people. But as a city, it has declined over the years. Some 35 uh, uh, miles north of Ephesus is the city of Smyrna. Now, that doesn't sound like a long distance, 35 miles. But when you think that... Uh, in the time that it would take them to get from Ephesus to Smyrna, we could be in Southern California. Uh, it puts things in a little more perspective. And it helps to explain a little bit why there's such a radical difference between these two churches. Now, as I mentioned before, these letters were written to seven literal churches which were in kind of a circle uh, in Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey. And uh, they were written to those individual churches, but they were also pertinent to seven ages of the church throughout history. Now, Ephesus covered a period of about 31 AD to about the year 100. And Smyrna covers the period from 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. Now, these dates are not specific, and let me be clear, these are not time prophecies, because 
you could not know ahead of time when these churches would arise. It is in retrospect that we see prophecy fulfilled through these churches. <clears throat> but um, in Ephesus' case, it kind of dwindled out as Smyrna blended in. And so the, the date 100 is not very specific. But the date 313 is pretty specific, and we'll get into the reason for that a little bit later. But Smyrna was a city that was on a, uh, a bay that was reached quite a ways inland, and it gave it quite an advantage as a shipping center, and it was uh, known for its export of myrrh. And that is why the city is named Smyrna, which is just a variance in the way uh, myrrh is pronounced. But um, I know that some modern uh, commentators have said, no, it was named for uh, Samara, which was a goddess. But that goddess was only worshipped in Smyrna, and the goddess was named after the city, not the city after the goddess. They also had a goddess there named Roma. Uh, in other words, they worshipped anything that they thought was important. They would build a temple to it, and it became kind of a, a public uh, idea of worship. There wasn't so much of individual dedication to the gods that they worshipped, there as it was kind of a patriotic and a community thing that they did as they offered uh, and had parties. They offered incense to them and they did various disgusting things as well. But uh, we need not get into that. But it is uh, a fact that the, the Christians there could not participate in that. Now, this uh, city was known as the Resurrected City, which also plays into the, uh, uh, the idea, the theme of this, uh, of this letter to uh, Smyrna, because it is about uh, life and death and resurrection. And so it was known as the resurrected city because it was overrun by the Persians and destroyed. But when Alexander the Great took over uh, for the Greeks, he rebuilt built the city entirely. And they had a, uh, uh, probably the first shopping mall. Uh, it was a three-story mall. That's what it was. They called it the Agora. And it was uh, where they shopped, and it became world famous. This was a rich community. And that becomes important when we see the description of the church in Smyrna. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, there's kind of a formula that uh, Jesus went through as he... Uh, gave each of these letters to the churches. First, there was an introduction. And that introduction was an introduction of himself. And that introduction had something to do with their particular need. And next, there was a commendation, if he had a commendation for that particular church. And there's... Uh, one church that he does not have a commendation for, and that happens to be ours. But, uh, and then the next thing was a criticism of that particular church, if he had one. And in this case, he has no criticism for Smyrna. And that is partly why this is the shortest of the letters but it does not diminish its importance. And then after the uh, criticism was a challenge, something that they could overcome. 
and then there was a promise. And all of these promises are given to those who overcome. And that is the reason for this series that, uh, that I'm giving here on, on this, because we all need to be overcomers. We all have something to overcome. And this is pretty inclusive. When you go through all of the uh, churches, you will find yourself there probably in numerous places. And so it is important that he didn't write this just for a local audience at a certain time. He wrote this for us upon whom the ends of the world have come. Now I mentioned that, uh, that myrrh was an export. That's another clue to the, uh, and that's the name of the church. Another clue is because myrrh was used uh, for many, many things and it was very expensive. Uh, but it was used as uh, a medicine for cold sores, for everything from cold sores to cancer and leprosy. And it was uh, uh, used internally for indigestion. And it was, uh, the main use of it was for embalming. And that, once again, has to do with, uh, with death. And this is the reason uh, that it is mentioned. Now, the introduction to the church at Smyrna, uh, let's just read it, and into the angel, now I've mentioned before that when it says angel, that doesn't mean a creature with wings in uh, scripture. The word angel was one of those words that, uh, that they did not translate because angel is a Greek word and it means minister or it means messenger. Uh, and so when he writing to the angel of the church, he's writing to the messenger so that the messenger can give this message to the people. And so to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Now it's important to notice that all of these introductions have to do with what John saw in Revelation 1 when he turned and he, he saw this magnificent being who later he recognized as Christ in his priestly robes. He uh, identified him and uh, one of the things that it says there is when John fell down on his face in fear, uh, then uh, in Revelation 1.17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, the Christians at that time, the Jews, uh, both were reluctant to take the words I am on their lips. And so they'd speak to the, of themselves usually in the third person. This is why John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And Matthew never even speaks in the first person. He calls himself Matthew. And this is... Uh, so when somebody would say, I am, he is claiming something. And this is the great I am. And it's important that uh, we recognize that Jesus is not just a, uh, just a tool that God used in some way. He is very God. He is the first and the last. He is, was from the beginning. He'll be all the way through. And this was an important 
item of identification to this people because they weren't sure of their permanence. They weren't sure of where they stood, where they were going to last all the way through. And he said, I am the first and the last, which was dead and am alive. So resurrection becomes, uh, right at the very first of the letter, becomes an important uh, fact for the Smyrna church. Um, I know thy works. He said that to uh, the church of Ephesus as well. But in Ephesus it is implied that they were continuing to work but their heart had gone out of it. And it's kind of hard to understand how there could be such a difference in 35 miles where Ephesus was an active church. They were doing things, but their heart had gone out of it. But they were not suffering persecution. But here, 35 miles away, was the heart of persecution, uh, the beginning of uh, the persecution that lasted a very long time. And uh, I've tried to understand that. It seems to me that Ephesus was one of the very first churches. Paul visited there early in his ministry. And they had persecution during that time. There was considerable persecution, particularly of Paul. But as they learned to get along, as they learned to uh, fit in into society, uh, the per persecution began to die. And as the persecution died, so did their zeal. Sometimes I think we try too hard to get along. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to uh, arouse enemies in the community. And so we blend in. And I think this is probably what happened uh, in Ephesus's case, because even during this time of persecution in Smyrna, which was only 35 miles away, they were uh, enjoying relative quiet uh, in that way. I know thy works, he said, and your tribulation or your or suffering. I know you suffer. And I know you're poor. I know your poverty. But you are rich. Can't help but think of uh, Matthew 5 where it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, there is a poverty that is physical, and I suppose that these people here had that, uh, and will, for reasons that I'll get into in a, in a couple of moments. But... I think the main thing was that they recognized their need. That is the most critical factor. Because here we have a direct contrast between the church who God had no criticism of to the church that he had no commendation for. Because in the Laodicean church, he said, you think you're rich, but you're poor. And here, he says, you think you're poor, but you're rich. You have riches that no one can count. And this was true of that church. They were spiritually rich and materially poor. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and they are not, for the synagogue of Satan. Um, there's a lot in that particular passage. Uh, 
But I wanted to point out that, um, that this uh, church also represents a period of time. And that period of time was uh, about the year 100. But actually, this, he probably wrote this, uh, this letter to Smyrna in the 90s. And their persecution probably started in the 70s. And uh, that came as a result of uh, kind of an odd set of circumstances. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. And according to prophecy, the Christians there uh, listened to Jesus when he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, uh, stand in the holy place. And he said, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. So they knew that they were supposed to run when that happened, and they did, and they fled. And then they went to many places, including, <clears throat> apparently, Smyrna. Now, um, this added to uh, a jealousy that was happening in Smyrna with the Jews. Now, the Jews there, uh, who were not Christians... Uh, tended to hate the Christians in the community. The rest of the people hated them both. But Jews had a certain protection because when uh, Rome took over the world, they um, r recognized that people who had an established old religion where, where they had, you know, they're kind of grandfathered and they could continue to uh, worship in the way that they always had. Uh, and so they were uh, exempted from having to worship the emperor or to offer incense to the local gods uh, as long as they paid a tax. They called it the tax, the Jewish tax. And Christians up until this time were kind of under that umbrella because they were considered just the de denomination of the Jews, just a, a sect of the Jews. And so, but what happened is that the Jews began to complain and, and claim that the Christians were not Jews. And that's probably true in a certain sense. But they didn't mean it in a, in a kind way. They wanted the Christians to get in trouble for not worshiping the idols. And the, so this became about in 72 um, also uh, they began to wonder what to do with the Christians when they were on trial for their faith. And the Emperor Trajan, being a good politician, I suppose, he said, well, don't go after, don't go after the Christians. Leave them alone. But if they're on trial for anything else, if they're found to be a Christian, then execute them and confiscate their properties. So the Jews that were in Smyrna saw in this an opportunity. And so they slandered the Christians. That is, they blasphemed. That is, they, they would accuse them of almost anything. And it didn't matter what. Because in those days, they didn't have a state prosecutor. Uh, you could accuse somebody, and then you would be the prosecutor. And so the Jews would do this. They'd accuse a Christian of stealing their sunshine or, or putting a curse on their baby or whatever. And then they'd get him in front of the magistrate and then they'd say, well, this person is a Christian. So they would automatically lose the trial and the Jews would then confiscate their property. And this is why 
the Christians there were poor is because they, uh, the Jews would say, um, I like your house, I'd like to have it. Or would you rather I take you to court? And so this is uh, kind of the background of what they're talking about slander here. But you know, when I read this, it sounds a little bit harsh. He says, I know your works and your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of those which are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You'd think maybe the, the next words would be some kind of commiseration, some kind of, I'm so sorry I got you into this, and I'm going to step in and stop things. But no, the rest of the message is it's going to get worse. And it raises the question, where is God when we suffer? Don't you care that we suffer? And that reminds me, of course, of uh, Mark 4, where the story of the tempest, where Jesus told them to get in the ship and go to the other side. So they were specifically doing what God told them to do. They weren't in trouble because they were out of God's will. But they got in the boat and it says there that there were other little ships with them. Which I think is an important fact that we need to keep in mind. There were other little ships with them. And then they went out and a storm arose and they did everything that they could, which I think is an important thing. They did everything that they could to stop the, uh, the trouble that they were in. But when it came to it, the soon the boat was full of water. And uh, that, I think, is a kind of a sad commentary on all of us, so often we wait until the boat is full before we think about calling on Jesus. But they called on Jesus and he was asleep in the boat. Talk about peace that passes understanding. How could he be asleep in the boat? But God waits so often to be asked before he acts. And then the question was asked, Carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care that we're suffering? Don't you care that we're about to die? And Jesus gives kind of a strange answer. First he says, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and the waves quit. There was a great calm. And then he said, Why were you fearful? Now these were seasoned seamen. They knew what they were doing. They did everything they could. They trimmed the sails. They rowed into the, into the waves. They bailed as fast as they could. And they knew that it had reached a critical spot where they were going to go down to the bottom of the sea. And to be asked, why were you afraid? Why did you fear? Just didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Until you think about it. And I think that's the message for all of us. You know, we all have our individual suffering. We all are going through our own little private storm in one way or another. At least you are or you will be or you have been. And when it comes to the idea of fear, that is something that doesn't belong there because we need to realize that Jesus is in the boat with us. 
And this is what he means when he says to the Smyrna church, I know. I know. And it isn't like somebody who tells you, oh, I know what you're going through, when you know they don't have a clue. He's saying, I know because he does know. He went through it all. He went through it all for us. And he goes through it all with us. I don't know about you, but uh, I would much rather suffer than see my children suffer. And yet, God is in that condition where he has to watch his children suffer. So when he says to the Smyrna church, I know, I know, but it's going to get worse. But I'm going to be there. I'm the first and the last. I'm the resurrection. And, you know, our, our perspective is so limited. We see so, so, such short distance. We can't, we can't see the end from the beginning. But we have a heavenly Father. We have a Savior who knows and who's there and who'll see it's through. And the idea, you know, that there are other little ships out there. There's other people. He uh, kind of alludes to that uh, where he says, fear none of the things that you're going to suffer, that you are about to suffer, it literally says. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. Um, it's one of those things that is hard for some people to take, is that the, the gifts of God are not handed out um, equally, necessarily, and the suffering that people endure is not handed out evenly either. And so, it's, you may not, um, you may have a hard time believing this, but when the big persecution started under the various emperors after this, um, the church grew so fast uh, that they decided they had to do something about it. And at a certain point, they began to really go after the Christians, and particularly the leaders, and they would take them and they'd pull their arms off. And they'd do, you know, just horrible things to them. And, um, you know, they were uh, persecuted terribly. But not everybody received that treatment. And some of the people who didn't receive that treatment got jealous. And they turned themselves in. And after a while, they began, the, the church began to have to make a distinction between voluntary martyrs and those who uh, were martyred uh, against their will. And so, you know, it's kind of an odd thing that um, we take suffering to be such a stranger, such a, something to be avoided so much. And yet, back then, they took suffering for Christ to be the greatest of all pleasures, the greatest... You know, when uh, Jesus tells us, uh, Rejoice and be exceeding glad if you are chosen to uh, be persecuted. Um, you know, one of my favorite books in the Bible is Job. And Job never understood why he was chosen. And it's hard for us to even understand 
why it is that God let this happen to such a godly man. Nevertheless, when you look at it in perspective, we wouldn't even know Job's name if he hadn't gone through this. And Job, throughout eternity, is going to be ever so grateful for having stood up for God in the way that he did. You know, there is there's kind of implied in this statement to, uh, to the Smyrna church, listen, I know you're suffering, but I believe in you. You can do it. You can show up for God. You can last all the way through. And they didn't know what that might do. But, you know, the, the devil, it says here, the devil is going to throw you into jail. He didn't say the Jews are going to throw you into jail. He didn't say the Romans are going to throw you into jail. He said, Satan is your enemy. And he is the one who is behind this. But Satan... Uh, has one flaw in his logic. He thinks people think like he does. And when it comes down to persecution, <clears throat> they, uh, uh, they think that it's going to kill the church. But the seed of the martyrs, uh, I mean, it was the seed of the church. In other words, it was the result of the martyrdom of these people was that the church grew hand over hand faster than it ever had. And they, one emperor after another just uh, continually raised the bar of, of uh, punishment. They thought, oh, we just have to try a little harder. And they were just... Uh, unbelievable uh, suffering. Nevertheless, the church grew. And there was Trajan, then Hadrian, Decius, uh, Docian, and Diocletian. And there uh, is the meaning of the, the next little phrase. And he says, you will have persecution 10 days. And I mentioned before that this was not a time prophecy in general, but it does contain this particular time prophecy. And it was, relates to the day for a year principle. Because it wouldn't make any sense to say to Pergamum, the small city, that you're going to have persecution for 10 days. They've had persecution all their life. What do you mean you're going to have persecution 10 days? But under Diocletian, from 303 to 313 was the most terrible persecution imaginable. And they rounded up all of the all of the leaders of all of the churches, they confiscated all church property and they put out eyes and they pulled off arms and they chopped off members and they did everything that they could and they burned people at the stake. And all of this, uh, and it lasted exactly 10 years. And at the end of that time, Constantine came along and he recognized, hey, you know what, guys? This isn't working. The church is growing all the faster. We, we, if we can't lick them, let's join them. And so he became a Christian and that's in the next, in the next church. We'll talk about that. But there was... What does that mean to us that there is persecution 10 days? That means that it doesn't last forever. That means that there is an end. And that end may be your death, but there is an end. And then 
there is something better beyond. Some people also see in it the, uh, the test that uh, Daniel and his three friends had. For that was ten days. And when they were done being tested, they came forth victorious. And that, I think, also is a fair, fair use of the ten days. But there was not any particular ten days in, uh, in literal time. Uh, so this is another example of where a day for a year principle is, uh, is taken. And the people there in Smyrna would have had no, under, no problem understanding that principle because it was used all the time uh, by the Babylonians who had a big influence there as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, Jesus said uh, on the Sea of Galilee there in Mark 4, he said, where is your faith? And here he says, remain faithful unto death and you will receive a crown of life. I think we need to think about that question, where is your faith? Where is your, place, your faith placed? Is, it, is your faith placed on everything's going to turn out right? That things are going to get better? That I'm going to be healed? That, uh, that things will be rosy in my life? Is that where your faith is? You know, the, the question to the disciples, why did you fear, was not saying that um, you shouldn't fear because it's impossible for this boat to go to the bottom of the sea. That's not what he was saying at all. What he was saying is, why did you fear if it's God's will that this boat goes down to the bottom of the sea and you with it, why should that make you fear? As long as you're in God's hands, we don't need to fear. You know, the, uh, fear of death is probably worse than death itself. Uh, I looked it up uh, on the internet and just saw just hundreds and hundreds of references to the fear of death. Uh, thanatophobia, they call it, which thanatos is Greek for, for death, but uh, it afflicts most people. We have an irrational fear of death, and fear, you know, Hebrews um, 2.14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that is Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We don't need to fear death because he is the resurrection and the life. Um, not that he doesn't uh, heal people. He does all the time. And we have seen it in our church numerous times. But it occurs to me that our church is under attack. That our little church here is under attack of the devil. And he has struck down many of our people. And, you know, cancer is a big thing uh, in our church. And the devil thinks he's going to win uh, through that. But he will not. Amen. And, you know, the fact that God lets this happen is, is a fact that he trusts you. He believes in you. That's what the story of Job was all about. It was how much God trusted Job. He trusted him that he would 
stand by him no matter what the cost. And this is the principle of that is involved in the story of Smyrna. Uh, that none of these don't fear any of the things that you shall suffer, he says. You will be tried. God doesn't uh, tempt us, but he allows us to be tried. And to be tried means that he intends it for a good purpose, to strengthen, to uh, build strength. You know, it's just, uh, it occurs to me that uh, it is more important to live for Christ than it is to die for Christ. And, you know, a lot of people who fear death don't fear uh, the wasting of their time. And that's what life is made out of, is time. Uh, we each have given, been given, you know, the most precious gift that God could ever give. Life is just beyond measure incredible. And even people who uh, don't take advantage of eternal life still have a gift that is just amazing, that they can interact, that they have their choice, that they are alive. You know, we need to treasure the life that we have. These people in Smyrna, they understood that. You know, when the devil begins to persecute, and he will, and he does, I don't know whether you know this, but Amnesty International says about at least over 100,000 people, 100,000 Christians, a year die for their faith. Uh, they get more particular. It was 164,000 last year uh, died for their faith. We don't hear about them. We don't know them, but God knows them. And he's going to try that on us too. I just want you to be aware that if and when that happens to you, God is there. God knows. And he's able to raise you up at the last day. And that is the overall promise to him who overcomes. Overcomes what? Overcomes the fear of death. Overcomes their problems. Overcomes worrying about their uh, suffering. To him who overcomes, I will give a crown of life. He is the resurrection and the life. I want to read a statement by Ellen White from the book Christian Experience, page 229. Now we are confronted with a world in midnight darkness, almost wholly given over to idolatry. But the day is coming in which the battle will have been fought, the victory won. All will be a happy united family, clothed with the garments of praise and thanksgiving, the robe of Christ's righteousness. All nature in its surpassing loveliness will offer to God a constant tribute of praise and adoration. The world will be bathed in the light of heaven. The years will move on in gladness. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold greater than it is now. Over the scene, the morning stars will sing together, and the sons of God will shout for joy, while God and Christ will unite in proclaiming, There shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. Amen.
I wrote a little poem some time ago, and I was going to inflict it on you, but I can't find it. But <laughs> I can try, okay? Death sits a king, and on he rides, as trampling all his pale horse strides. Proud men bow low, and widows cry, and he brings pain to you and I. But sovereign though he seems to be, one sterling thought appeals to me, that at the de end of death's cruel ride, his victims will stand side by side on life eternal's sunlit shore. But death shall die forevermore. We'll sing our closing hymn now, He Lives.